Hi, Wayne Dorban here for the bi-weekly NTP Seed webinar huddle that we hold here at our Northern Colorado headquarters in Loveland, Colorado, both live here at our site and also going out over the web to those of you that are watching. Enjoy what we have for you today. This is uh, John Millen. I'm stepping in for Wayne Dorban today. I'll just let me give a brief introduction to uh, Giuseppe Lamana, the Chief Executive Officer officer with Ecologics. I hope I pronounced that right, Giuseppe. Giuseppe was born in Italy, uh, raised in Venezuela um, from our brief discussion before we got started, and uh, was educated here in the United States. And uh, Giuseppe, good afternoon and uh, welcome to SEED. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it very much and feel to uh, have been been given the opportunity to uh, present my views on uh, nutrition and uh, climate change. Um, perhaps, perhaps tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure, sure. I, I got an engineering degree in electronics um, in 1969 uh, from a Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, and then. Um, have had various jobs in engineering and in sales. In 1979, I formed uh, my own uh, company in Venezuela, uh, representing several divisions of Emerson Electric, same field, um, instrumentation, field, uh, uh, field instrumentation uh, for measurement and control. Um, and I did that for a number of years um, until I decided that um, helping the oil industry was not a good idea for me. So um, about uh, seven years ago, I divested from uh, my interest in Venezuela, and I've been uh, I've become a um, a uh, an ecologist. So. Um, since I had started on a whole foods plant-based diet 30 years ago, actually to last month, um, I found that the two are interconnected. In other words, what we eat not only uh, affects our mental and physical health, but it does uh, um, the earth as well. And this is the theme I would like to develop today uh, for the audience. That sounds good. We, uh, we look forward to it. So Giuseppe, why don't you uh, continue on and uh, we look forward to hearing it. Thank you. There's some key messages that I would like to emphasize to be able to uh, give the audience uh, some what I consider some good takeaway points. Um, the first is that uh, di diet is our primary promoter of health or sickness. That's kind of, today, that's kind of an obvious uh, point. Um, what's not so obvious is that an animal protein-based diet is the primary promoter or of cancer and many other degenerative diseases. Now, this has been proven in many, many epidemiological studies, and, and that statement uh, has been made by Dr. Colin Campbell. Um, Dr. Colin Campbell, to the ones that don't know him, to me is the most important nutritionist of the 20th century. He actually turned the nutrition ideas upside down. Um, he reversed the current thinking uh, way back uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago into what uh, they are proposing today. And um, and it is a radical change. We've always been used to um, believe that uh, beef 
for example, is uh, important and necessary to, to build uh, strong muscles and to uh, have enough protein uh, for ourselves, but this is not necessarily, uh, uh, this is not really necessary. We can uh, obtain protein from plant-based sources. Uh, the next statement is uh, has been made uh, by um, a former U.S. Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Everett Koop, who says that close to 70% of all Americans die of diet-related diseases. This is, to me, it is a shocking uh, truth. Um, uh, and he is certainly uh, cap you know, has the knowledge to make such a statement. But imagine, for example, if we ate the correct diet, all of the suffering and sicknesses that would be avoided. Uh, then the following one is that uh, nowadays there's about 800 million people that are perpetually hungry and on the other side of the coin there's about 1.5 billion of people that are either overweight or, or even more obese in the world. So some people are not getting fed enough and other people are not getting fed properly. So, because uh, overweight is a consequence of not a balanced diet. I'll go into details of this. Um, then another statement by Dr. Campbell is that a whole foods plant-based diet prevents an estimated 90% of all diseases. This is even a larger number than Dr. Koop. Um, uh, stated before. The first point here is that I got this information from the Centers of Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Systems. The U.S. spends about 2.8 trillion, and I emphasize the world, trillion on national health expenditures. This is a huge number by any way of measuring it, huge number, uh, that could be decreased tremendously if we had uh, a better, uh, more balanced diet. Uh, then looking at the planet-wide um, uh, perspective is that in the U.S., about 73% of all the calories grown are grown for feed and fuel. Feed of animals and fuel for cars. So really for human, direct human consumption, there's only 27% grown. Uh, next is um, if we go on a worldwide basis, about 45% of the calories grown are grown for feed and fuel. Another point is that half of the world's topsoil has been lost during the last 150 years. And then a statement by two ecologists from the World Bank is that if we take the livestock complete life cycle in consideration. Uh, this accounts for more than 51% of the total of the greenhouse, greenhouse gases generated in the world. This is again a an outstanding number. You know, it, it's a. I would almost say it, it's an incredible number, but I will try to explain um, how 
they got to that number. Dr. Campbell started his career after he's got, he got his medical degree in the Philippines doing a study of children that had liver cancer. Uh, and he found that the two fundamental causes of liver cancer in children were one, aflatoxin. Now, aflatoxin is a toxin derived from the yeast that covers um, um, peanuts and corn. According to doctors specializing in cancer, aflatoxin is the most powerful toxin in the world. And the other determining factor was animal protein. The more animal protein the children ate, the more likely they were uh, to get liver cancer. In other words, the higher income classes children had more liver cancer than the lower income classes children. So this was a first wake-up call for Campbell, who had grown in a farm, I believe, in uh, Ohio, uh, because he was used to having uh, eggs and bacon for breakfast, uh, uh, a glass of milk, and so on. So he, this started to uh, change, or at least modify in somewhat, his belief in animal protein as a fundamental uh, uh, a way of getting protein. Then he followed this study with a study a, using mice in the laboratory and um, he found also that aflatoxin and casein, the daily dairy protein, were the two determining factors of uh, cancer, liver cancer in mice. Here is a graph of uh, how the mice behaved with the um, a dairy protein and aflatoxin. The green group of mice, which is just exactly one half of the total group, were fed a 5% of dairy protein, uh, while the red group of mice were fed a 20% daily protein. They were both fed the same high amounts of aflatoxin. And you can see um, on the bottom, uh, as the weeks pass by, th three weeks, six, I'm sorry, that's, uh, that's a mistake. There the should not be a 4, but rather a 9 there, a 12 and 15 weeks. Uh, the uh, group, the green group, had no development of uh, cancer clusters in their liver, while the uh, red group had continually increasing um, clusters of liver cancers. So the next step was, okay, let's take the uh, red group of mice and feed them alternatively a 5% and 20% uh, dairy protein diet and let's see what happens. So in the first column, the one that's on top of the number 18, you can see that they reduce from 20% daily dairy protein to 5 and look what happens under up on top of 21. The cancer clusters decrease tremendously. So then they changed again from 5% to 20% uh, for another three weeks and the cancer clusters went up again to the same level that they were before. Uh, and then they changed again and the cancer clusters decreased remarkably, not as much as the first time, 
because their livers had been damaged already by the initial uh, number of early liver cancer clusters. And then again, they went up, they increased the protein intake, and up again to a high amount of cancer clusters. So, the conclusion of this study with mice is that even though the aflatoxin is the cause of the cancer, if you do not have a ripe field where the cancer can grow, uh, it will not. As exemplified by the green group in the previous slide, as well as by the red group in this slide, where you can see that um, uh, when you lower the percentage from 20 to 5, the, ca the cancer cluster diminished tremendously. So what Dr. Uh, Campbell needed now was, I mean, he had done research with mice. Now he needed to test his theory in, uh, in people. So he was lucky that in China they did a cancer atlas. That is, they took about 800 million people and charted where were the cancer deaths in China and what type and how many were, uh, were happening in China. And, uh, and he found uh, this a perfect um, a base for him to carry his study. And in this slide that you're looking right now, um, it shows the number of deaths per 100,000 people per year, cancer deaths. And um, for example, if you look at nasopharyngeal cancer in men, in some municipalities there were none, zero, while in others there were 75. At least in one other there were 75. If you look at uh, cancer of the esophagus in men, at least in one municipality there was only one, while in another municipality there was 100, uh, 435. These figures are extremely different from one another. So they ask themselves, why are they so different? I mean, one and one and 435 cancers of the esophagus are tremendously uh, different. It's 435 times uh, in one municipality versus another. For example, if you look at women, for example, stomach cancer, in one municipality, just two women died per 100,000 in a year uh, of stomach cancer, while in another municipality there was 141. Tremendous difference. One is 70 times approximately the other. So um, these great disparities um, had to be investigated. We in the West, when we have 20 or 30 percent more cancers in one area or for one reason or another in one uh, location or to another, we find that uh, extremely uh, meaningful. But imagine these. These are um, tremendously uh, significant. So what they decided, um, Dr. Campbell, that was at uh, Cornell University at the time, um, and decided to do a study. So he got together with the Chinese Academy of Preventive Medicine, with Oxford University, and the three of them, uh, three organizations, made the study. 
And the study, they took 65 municipalities, 6,500 people, half men, half women, uh, ages 35 to 64, and they studied a huge amount of variables, 367 variables. So this is a very, very complete study, and it was carried, carried on for years. Um, and they derived about 8,000 statistically significant associations from diet, lifestyle, and sicknesses or pathologies. Um, if you go to um, uh, the, you can find this study in Cornell University or uh, Oxford or at the um, uh, Chinese Academy of Preventive Medicine. Uh, I'm just, um, I will just show the, uh, some excerpts from it. They looked at these people and um, some of the uh, characteristics of their nutrition are shown on this chart. First of all, compared to the U.S. at the time, which is the early 80s, they were eating, they were taking in a lot more calories, about 30% higher number of calories per day. Uh, however, the amount of fat in those calories was about mm, less than half of what uh, a comparable group in the States. The dietary fiber in grams per day was about almost three times as much. What does that mean? It means that uh, these people ate a lot of whole grains, vegetables, and fruits as compared to the U.S. at the time, which was 12 grams average, 12 grams per day. The uh, number, the total uh, grams per day of protein uh, was about one two thirds of what it was in the states, 64 to 91 percent. But the real eye opener here is that the amount of animal protein that these Chinese people ate was not even one percent of their total daily calories consumed versus. 10 to 11 percent typical or average in the states. Uh, this is a very significant number. Uh, less than 1 percent was animal protein. That means to me that if you have a hundred meals, so say you have 21 meals per week, so a hundred meals is approximately four weeks. That means that every four weeks you have an entire meal that, uh, uh, made of animal protein. Maybe a steak, uh, chicken, eggs, uh, cheese, but just one meal out of, um, I'm sorry, 21 out of five weeks uh, this is about that. That's the equivalency. One meal complete of animal protein per five weeks. Okay, approximately. And the last, uh, uh, the last uh, figure here is that these people, the total intake of these people daily was about twice as much as the people, the equivalent group in the States. And have you ever heard of that, you know, if you have low iron in your blood, you need to eat meat? Well, that is obviously not true, uh, as this slide shows. We're done with the uh, China study, and we'll look at a study, or actually a review of two studies made in the States. Uh, this review was uh, done by Harvard University um, in 2012. 
Uh, the two studies were a doctor's study, uh, 37,000 uh, men approximately, and nurses, at about 83,000 nurses. And the conclusion was that red meat consumption is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So it increases your risk of getting this disease, but is associated with cancer mortality. There's no uh, increased risk. This is uh, cancer mortality. So that's another study that points to uh, uh, animal protein consumption and its effects on the human body. I would like to uh, then uh, give you other examples of other epidemi epidemiological studies uh, that are related um, uh, to this. We'll start with the next slide with uh, nutrition and breast cancer in women. Cancer, uh, doctors that are cancer uh, specializing in cancer tell us that the, some of the leading factors for breast cancer are a, an increase in female hormones in the blood, uh, a, an early first period, um, a late menopause, and increase in increased cholesterol level in the blood. And this is exactly what an animal protein rich diet and refined carbohydrates, carbohydrates produce. Currently, in uh, countries, um, well, basically any country that is uh, first world uh, developed countries, uh, girls are getting their first um, period when they're about 11, 12, maybe even 10 years old, while in countries that are not developed and do not have a such a diet, animal protein rich diet and refined carbohydrates, they're typically 16 to 18 years old. So there's a marked difference in there. This is another Harvard original investigation under the title of Preventing Prostate Cancer and Diet. Um, they found that 19 studies out of 23 provided a positive link between dairy product and prostate cancer. They stated one of the most consistent predictors of prostate cancer in the published literature. And the other four uh, studies is not that they found something totally different, it's just that they did not find uh, a, such a link. This is a study uh, of various countries, um, incidence of cancer in women, colorectal cancer. And you can, and you can see that countries like Nigeria have very little colorectal cancer, while countries like New Zealand have a high incidence of colorectal cancer. And that is related to the amount of animal protein intake, actually meat intake. So that's another study that was done in various countries. Uh, the two most famous cancer uh, institutions in the States are the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the MD Anderson in Houston. And they both treat cancer patients with a plant-based diet as part of their, of their integrative medicine service. The Texas University MD Anderson says that plant, a plant-based diet is used to reduce the risk of cancer by 30 or 40 percent. This is heart attacks in men uh, in 20 countries. Um, 
the as you see the percent uh, as the percent of animal protein take increases so do the number of deaths per 100,000 people due to heart attacks uh, this is 20 countries men ages 55 to 59 I'll show you some statistics from Norway before World War II during World War II and after World War II so this is uh, deaths from circulatory diseases heart attacks basically of uh, per 10,000 people per year these are Norway statistics uh, as the years from um, 1927 to 1940 the number of more uh, deaths kept increasing I I put that arrow in there so you can see the trend going up what happened in 1940 in 1940 the Germans invaded Norway and then Germ and the German army sequestered all of the cows pigs sheep chickens that uh, were in Norway to be used to feed the German army and the Norwegians were left with cereal grains beans vegetables and fruit so from 1940 until the end of World War II in 1945 the Norwegians had this diet so look at the different the new slope of the uh, of the, the trend slope how it completely changed from the previous slope this is a remarkable uh, a remarkable change what happens in 1945 well the Germans uh, leave and lose the war and the Norwegians start with their same animal protein diet bingo up it goes again so um, that's another um, sign of the that nutrition has a great effect in health and sickness this is uh, a study of diabetic children and these are children between uh, just born and 14 years old and as you can see the uh, curve uh, increases of diabetes 1 this is a terrible disease diabetes 1 is a terrible disease uh, in Japan and Israel very little they basically have no milk to for feed uh, uh, for the children Canada is up Denmark up higher Norway higher up and Finland even higher so that's a direct relationship all of those countries are first world countries developed so it's a quite telling now the University of Kentucky did a study on uh, diabetics they took 50 diabetics 20, 25 with diabetes 1 type 1 and 25 with diabetes 2 what they fed these people just for three weeks very short time they gave them a diet in high whole grain cereals plus vegetables plus one uh, serving of cold meat per day the 25 patients with diabetes 1 had an improvement in insulin reduction by 40 percent their sugar levels improved dramatically and cholesterol reduction by 30 percent the 25 patients of type 2 diabetes had a remarkable remarkable 24 out of 25 
were able to com completely discontinue insulin treatment. This is amazing. Just three weeks with a change of diet that could have this effect on diabetic patients, type 2 diabetic patients. This is not a, an experiment. This slide is not an experiment, but it's simply the observations by the researchers in China and in uh, the countries of the West. In China in the 80s, there were no overweight people in rural China. However, Chinese immigrants to Western countries, they succumb to obesity. So it's not something related to the Chinese people that they don't belong, uh, they don't uh, become fat or overweight. It is simply the diet. I took uh, Dr. Campbell's statement that 90% of all diseases are diet related and uh, put it into the shape of a tree. And my idea is that the trunk of the tree is bad nutrition, you know, uh, and that cardiovascular obesity, diabetes, cancer, and a whole slew of other diseases are related to uh, diet. Pretty powerful, huh? So in other words, what we should be treating is nutrition, not the effects of nutrition. Of course, we, we need to, but we need to start taking a serious look at nutrition. Um, these are some of the world-class vegan athletes, because the, there's a prevalent idea that if you are a vegan, you're a weak link. A weak link. Uh, well, uh, these, uh, this list shows some very uh, uh, powerful athletes in wrestling, Iron, uh, you know, Iron Man or Iron Woman, um, heavyweight boxing champions, ultra marathoners, uh, uh, power lifting champions, uh, uh, Mr. Universe. These are world class vegan athletes. So uh, it isn't true that if you eat a plant-based diet, you're going to be a weakling. I myself have had this diet now for 30 years and I'm 67. I feel pretty strong and um, and I, you know, I'm by no means a weakling. This is what I would, I call world-class vegan athletes. The athletes has to be, end quote. Uh, the left one most is um, Mr. Um, uh, give me a second. I forget his, his name. Is uh, uh, well, he's a famous triathlete, uh, a Canadian triathlete. Um, give me a second. Uh, excuse me. I I cannot recall his name. Anyway, the center. Uh, one is, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Einstein. He was a mind athlete. And on the right is a beautiful, young, 74-year-old lady who is a uh, vegan as well. So that, to me, is uh, quite telling. Next, please. So, my proposal in this and your takeaway, forget about meat, beef, chicken, cheese, milk, white bread, or refined rice, or refined anything, and switch to brown rice and the other cereal grains, vegetables, beans, fruits, and uh, nuts and seeds.
this is a partial list of the foods that I'm proposing. Uh, cereal grains, vegetables, legumes, fruits, nuts, seeds, and oils. Based on these epidemiological studies, Dr. Uh, Campbell uh, states that a whole foods plant diet, well you can read it yourself, 90, prevents 95 percent of all cancers including those quote-unquote caused by environmental toxins. If you remember when we uh, talked about aflatoxin and dairy protein at the very beginning of this uh, talk, um, it seemed that aflatoxin did nothing to the mice uh, that were being tested, that the promoter was the one that really um, made all the difference. So that is why Dr. Campbell says, quote, uh, call, um, I'm sorry, quote, unquote, caused by envir environmental toxins, prevents nearly all heart attacks and strokes, reverses even severe heart disease, and prevents and reverses type 2 diabetes, so that it is dangerous to continue using insulin after three days on this regimen. And if you're overweight, it gets you back to your ideal weight in a healthy way. And this is what made me change to this diet 30 years ago. I used to have frequent colds, flu, sore throats, and intestinal distress. And I decided, well, that there had to be a better way. So I, I started researching and found um, that this diet was a good diet and I am more convinced than ever that it is a good diet for everyone. This is a uh, just restating uh, the, this, this, a, the first uh, or second slide is how the US, US health care budget is impinged with the expenditure of 2.8 trillion dollars. I'm going to start talking about the effects of um, global warming or climate change and we'll go then later to the cause, one of the main causes of it as I, so the, uh, the poles are melting um, Worldwide, food prices are increasing dramatically. The ocean is warming, acidifying, and increasing in level. And there's an estimated 12,000 species uh, extinctions per year currently. These are two photos taken by NASA satellites, one in 1979 and one in 2007. You can see at the same time of the year, so you can see that there's a big part of the North Pole that has melted away. The land area of this uh, slide, of the, the, melt, the part that melted away, is approximately three size is the size of Texas, which is a fairly big state. So about three times the size of Texas has just melted away. The combined uh, contribution of the Greenland melt and the Antarctica melt, because the North Pole is not contributing to the sea level rise, but Greenland and Antarctica, yes they do, and the combined, an estimated that uh, it's growing by uh, about half an inch per year. This is a huge, huge number. You know, uh, it is estimated that unless we change to a low carbon 
economy, by the year 2100, it is estimated that sea level rise be, will be upwards of 33 inches. This will affect uh, coastal cities around the globe and, uh, in my opinion, create havoc. This droughts, much more frequent droughts, uh, this is Africa and China, Africa in 2010 and China in 2011. This is uh, right around the corner. Texas 2012, big drought. So these droughts are pushing pri food prices up. Forest fires, a lot of forest fires, even in your neck of the wood, John, in, um, in Colorado. Uh, these ones are in Australia and the U.S., but there's forest fires in many, many parts of the world. And why do they happen? Well, as the temperature rises, there's less humidity in uh, close to the ground. Um, droughts uh, dry the uh, vegetation, and fires can start easier. It's another photo of Texas. According to the UN, currently 41% of the earth, of the, uh, uh, the part of the uh, ground of the earth, 41% is either a uh, desert or desertified. I'm not sure how that is stated in English. So. Uh, 41%. And unless we uh, change um, to a low carbon um, economy by the year of 2025, the estimation is 70%. This is a huge number that threatens all of us. These are uh, the desert. Um, there's many deserts and they are advancing and they're pushing people away from them. For example, North Africa is uh, pushing people to take these boat rides and go to Europe because of, well, in a, in a desert, nothing grows. So um, this is what's happening. There's, there's eco-migrations. This is just a map of India, where there's been eco-migrations in several places uh, because of uh, dry weather. If people cannot grow food for their sustenance, what are they going to do? Um, one of the reasons for what is called the Arab Spring last year and, and this year has been high food prices on one hand and lack of um, ability to grow food in another. Uh, for example, in Syria, it is estimated that five million peasants left their fields because they couldn't grow anything due to the droughts and they went to cities that were badly uh, served and overpopulated already. And that created a breathing ground of dissatisfaction and um, uh, these uh, uh, wars that are happening there right now. So there's even environmental causes to the current Middle East wars. In other parts of the world, there's great floods. So uh, just two photos of recent floods. This is a uh, graph. It's uh, a little old right now. It is uh, up to 2011. But it shows how little by little the damage, the cost in billions of US dollars due to weather disasters is increasing. 
Um, in uh, let's see, uh, 2011, it was uh, about 160 billion dollars, and it's up from that because that does not take into account Hurricane Sandy. That it in itself, I think it was like 30 billion or so. So it's uh, it's increasing. So what's happening when you have more uh, carbon dioxide in the air and that is in contact with water. Well, that carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid and that is what is happening in the seas and that is why the uh, pH is getting more acidic in the seas. So that's a, a um, I took this uh, from a, a, um, a magazines, but a, even though if it's funny, the the truth it is it's not funny at all. Just say this is John. If I could just interrupt you for one moment here, this is fascinating. Some of the just all the statistics and evidence and what you're presenting is I'm, I'm sure people are going to find it most interesting. We did have a question from someone. If I could interrupt you a bit, you still have quite a few slides to go through and. Uh, we would love maybe to have you come back again for an hour if you could ever spare the time because uh, we are coming up on our hour here. But Teresa, one of our listeners, was wondering if we could go back to what you were talking about with diet. And uh, she had a question, you know, all the results that you were speaking of and the cancer-causing effects of some of the foods, what effect do you think uh, what the livestock is being fed has to do on that? According to uh, Dr. Campbell, um, and there is no measurable effect whether the livestock is fed uh, uh, corn and soy or is um, at pasture. Yeah. So naturally, grass fed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, grass fed, right. Mm -hmm. And I'll be glad to come back uh, for the other half of the presentation because it's a very long presentation. I realize that. So I'll be glad to come back. Sure. Well, that would be wonderful. Another question that I had, just from a, a personal you know, question, and that was, why is it, do you think, and I, I know they talk about our diet, especially here in America, and I lived in China for a while, and I, I saw the, you know, the basic diet that um, they eat in China, but here in America, it seems like while the American Medical Association tries to talk about it, I don't think they emphasize it enough and wondering what, why do you think that is that uh, we don't, you know, our diet is not spoken about, you know, with all these statistics. Um, I'm going to be very blunt here, okay? Um, Please be. I feel, uh, this is what I observe in the whole medical profession, whether it be in the States, in, um, in Europe, in South America, um, I don't know about Asia, okay? What I feel is that the whole medical profession, if you look at it from a Western point of view, is based on a fundamental flaw and I'll explain what I mean. To me, the fundamental flaw is that people only go to the doctor when they feel sick. And the doctor, you know, receives the patient and has to somehow um, cure him. But um, so that that's the that's the uh, uh, that's the objective truth, you know. You only go to the, see the doctor when you're sick, and the doctor, you know, receives you and he's supposed to fix you up. Okay. Well, I have a parallel to us not changing the oil in our car until the engine breaks. Uh, so the fundamental flaw that I find with Western medicine, 
with the Western medicine system is that if the doctor and the patient work together in attaining good health for the patient, the whole thing would be a lot simpler, easier, less painful, and less costly. But the whole Western medical system rests on a, on a look at disease instead of, instead of looking at the person and trying to w maintain his health. Um, when I got into this uh, diet that I've had for the past 30 years, I decided, well, why isn't this, why is the system, in my opinion, backwards? Why doesn't, for example, the patient and the doctor work together to keep the patient healthy? And as long as the patient is healthy, he pays the doctor. In other words, suppose that the patient is sick for two weeks a, a year. Okay, the rest of the number of weeks during the year, the patient pays the doctor. So that the doctor is interested in keeping the patient healthy. So that is the fundamental flaw that I find with Western type medicine. And it's in, this, it's in the States, it's in Europe, it's in Latin America, it's the same. To me, it's a design flaw of the system. So. Perhaps we could end on that note today. And uh, I think we've come up against our hour here. Okay. Um, we cannot thank you enough for uh, enlightening us and educating us on such a topic that uh, we can see you're so passionate about and obviously a lot more people should become a little bit more passionate about their diet so um, we thank you and uh, I'm sure we will be in touch and hopefully um, we can uh, schedule you um, for another time to complete your slides and uh, we found it very 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 interesting and thank you again for your time. Thank you John I appreciate very much I uh, your the opportunity you give me to present my views and uh, I will be um, ready to um, talk about the second part uh, once uh, we both decide a convenient time. Thank you. We look forward to it and on behalf of C this is John Nolan we'll sign off for today and uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody in two weeks. Thanks again have a good day. Yeah thank you bye bye.